So first off, if I um, this metaverse thing, if I say the word three times, I will probably vomit in my mouth. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to wander on that. But what I, um, my idea for this talk was to actually focus a bit on the things that we all uh, deal with, struggles we deal with, um, but also uh, some of the things we don't talk about often. We talk about really constructive things today, but also uh, maybe some of the things that aren't going as well. And that's something I'd like to touch on today. Um, and obviously, I'm not going to talk about uh, a, a certain company rebranding itself, but I do have some philosophical thoughts about if we should consider attack as sort of like a metaverse. Because I think that a lot of the things we're doing, we're actually doing that within attack and within all the new um, matrixes, for example. But there's also a lot of lessons in there, and today I'd like to share some of the lessons I had, at least on my side, for uh, uh, mostly on what I like to call scenario-based defense. And that is also something I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of. Uh, next to uh, being a Lego aficionado, I'm also a big fan of actually working like, what is the bigger picture? What is the red line we're seeing across campaigns, across actors, etc.? And I tried to figure that out, make it actionable for companies, have them test it and work through that. And I actually built programs, for example, for intelligence programs, who then, uh, which then actually work with that and test that and really qualify that, that threat angle. Because I don't think that's happening often. I'm not a Call of Duty one versus one knifing expert, but I do enjoy gaming. And you can all also uh, hit me up if you if you want to do some cool painting and stuff like that. <clears throat> and first, I, I, how I'd like to shape this conversation is is just addressing the evolution part with some of the things we all actually we probably all know. Then I'd like to go into the nuanced discussion of who actually adopted, who's adopting attack, but also then who has adopted the tech and then actually started using it. And let's get immediately down to business. So for those of you who aren't familiar with attack and have seen it for the first time, one thing I always get is, what the heck is this thing? It is completely terrifying me. And I get this question actually often, more than I'd like to. It's because of the complexity, it's because of the the amount of techniques in it. And if you're if like me, and, and you've been around doing this for quite a while, I've been working with attack since 2017, to be precise. And I actually saw it grow from that little you know, amount of techniques, uh, or at least a little overview it was at the time, to something which it is now, you know, 188 techniques, uh, many supporting tools, many matrices. You know, if I have this conversation with a lot of people who are pretty scared and they, they, they even though we have, I, I sometimes make fun with Adam and ask him like, do you have a new flag? Because the flags keep getting bigger. Now they actually get getting smaller. Eh? So that's good, that's good. Um, but people, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, this is what they, they tell me at least. So I'm also curious how that discussion will, you know, evolve over the next three years. If people will uh, have more opinions on that. And another thing that I find sometimes getting a bit of less attention is the amount of frameworks we're currently seeing, matrixes we're currently seeing. I get that we need to expand, and I think that's a good, I think that's a good, uh, uh, I think that's really good. But I, th I also think that it's sometimes confusing for some that they don't really understand what is in what component, what is in what matrix. And one of the issues you have with uh, these matrices is, is that you also have the issue of compartmentalization. So what that means is, for example, you can have similar techniques, but the procedures differ completely within ICS and from cloud. And that is something that all of us might get, but when we have to explain that to other people, people are like, yeah, but it's the same technique. How does it work then? So that is, uh, that is sometimes an issue. And obviously, still a shout out to uh, pre-attack. I, I do love it, indeed. Um, it's, it's too bad it's gone, but actually the replacement is, is pretty good. So this is also one of the things that, that terrifies my, my, the people I work with. And now the second element in terms of evolution, or the third element in terms of evolution, and then I'll probably close the evolution bit, is the, the way we tell stories with attack. You know, naturally, it is a good means to do that. You can actually simply grab the matrix, grab a framework, or grab, grab 
fill it in, and then you have a good story to tell. But to actually tell that story, that requires a lot of technical understanding. And sometimes people underestimate that. You know, people underestimate the fact that we all can explain real the technical procedures, but you know, we forget that we have to roll that narrative up to, to people that don't really get it. And another, yeah, uh, uh, two uh, other components, which I personally think are also some uh, fallacies in terms of what, what, how people use it, is the, the assumption that it's complete, that it is a finite thingy. And people ask me, like, hey, why isn't this in there? It's like, yeah, because it isn't complete. You can actually evolve this, right? And that is actually, this is sometimes giving me a really hard time when I'm helping clients with this kind of work. And I really think that this, especially the assumption, that's something we all need to manage on that. And finally, when I tell a story about a tag, it's also good that I can grab uh, all the stuff the team from Adam worked on and put in the matrix. But there's also a lot of people also take these contents at face value, right? I'm sure all of you have, have seen the example where you would have a certain individual, enthusiastic, dive into uh, the matrix and then grab, you know, select five actors or anything and then work with that. But then again, it could be that these are outdated uh, results, right? It could be that these were from three years ago where your team might be focusing perhaps on things that are, I don't know, three days ago. Let's say a certain invasion happens and you want to know a latest on a certain group, you know? Where do you grab that from and is that the latest? Something to think about, but this is also something I, 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 I'm sometimes having limitations with. So I'll not get into evolution part anymore. I'll, now I'm focusing on adoption. And I would like to make a big nuance between adoption and usage. And why is that? Because I, I see sometimes people adopting the framework, but then actually starting using it actively, I consider that a different thing. And now the elephant in the room, who is actually using attack? And I think this is, uh, uh, when I was making the slide, I thought this was controversial. Um, because we all think, if we trust all the research papers, then we all think everybody's using it, right? Yeah. Everybody's probably using it. I mean, uh, the, uh, I, I open up a research paper, and then you find that 80 to 100% of the people are using it. But I tend to think that that is incorrect. I tend to think that we, um, we perceive that adoption uh, uh, too greatly. And I think that that leads to certain assumptions. For example, people tailoring marketing materials to, to fit the tech, just to fit the tech. And I think that, you know, there's a difference between obviously the enterprise sized companies and also the small medium sized companies. And I do think that you know, all enterprise sized companies adopted the tech. I do also think that the, 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 the enterprise below the large companies, they also have adopted the tech. Um, but that's where you see the nuance happening between full adoption and full and, and, and nuanced usage. And this is something this we aren't discussing this enough, in my opinion. And another thing I was thinking when I was building this 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 story is also like, you know, who is actually adopting this? Is, are there any differences in uh, my experience? And actually there is none. I tend to think that the private sector, but also the public sector, um, they both, uh, they both ad adopt it uh, in an efficient way. And what I tend to see is that um, this also has to do with the consulting companies that they have in, in, in with them. So for example, if you have a, a consultancy company, um, then fair chance that that company has mapped everything to attack, right? So you can't really do anything without you know, falling over attack. So that's pretty good, I think. And I didn't really see any differences in, uh, in, in the company size, for example, as well. So then again, you know, bottom line, I don't see any differences. I think adoption is everywhere. And one of the limitations, obviously, is attack is a operationally driven, tactically driven concept, right? Um, but at the moment we all start to explore, you know, new applications be beyond that, we, th we struggle. And, and obviously there are, uh, you know, people that have found new ways to rethink risk management, found new ways how to tell a good story. But this is also leading to some, you know, some, some biases on, on simple things like people wanting to simplify stuff, for example. 
And that, what that means is, uh, for me, that's a trigger in, in when people, um, they can't really work with the level of detail, and then they resort to, obviously, like, we're all humans, right? So we all simplify. That is all what we do. But what I tend to see is that if we have a bunch of, and I think the previous speakers also alluded to that, it's a lot of details, and we have to visualize it in a good way to understand it. And I think this is, this is a problem. We, we, not everyone can, uh, can work with that. So we have to roll that up or work with that any way we can. And the framework also allows us to, to do very granular risk management. And one thing I, did, I do find, and I think the granularity is, for me personally, is really awesome. Because I can, when I help clients and I, and I investigate, I, put a, I perform assessments to understand what their threat landscape is and how, who is operating in that. And then that granularity allows me to help them prioritize. And I think that is the most important thing, prioritize what kind of basics you need to do versus what kind of detailed, nuanced stuff you need to focus on. Um, and that, that is also, I think, for most companies, the main driver of using attack. Um, where do you start? What is the one thing you should do? And I'd like to also make the analogy of the kill chain, where I personally think that the kill chain is a sequential concept. and attack is maybe a, a quantum thing, right? You can have things simultaneously, but also sequentially. But the thing what I'd really like is that it, it allows you to look left and it look right and work with that. Um, but that prioritization, then you can have a discussion within your company to actually see where do we want to focus on or not. One, may, one way to, to, to use that is obviously the navigator, right? The navigator, we talked about this, and I think somebody will, um, excuse me, We'll talk about that uh, soon as well. I think that's uh, I think that still is a pretty useful concept. I think it's a bit uh, yeah, rigid, if you ask me, but I still enjoy the um, I still enjoy the the applications of it, and I really enjoy the fact that people start to to move away from bingo cards to you know nuanced heat maps. I think that 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 was a win when we got that. Um, but that also created another discussion, and what actually I like to call the scoping discussion. And I, I still find a lot of companies uh, uh, just selecting everything and then, you know, grabbing what is trending, what is red or whatever at that point in time. I think the scoping discussion is always very important, personally, because that allows you to focus, to prioritize. We don't have all the time in the world, right? We just have to focus on the main things that are happening. And, and that's why I think the scoping discussion is also very important, what you select in the framework and how you then use that. And there's also... Uh, a, a little thing that is sometimes forgotten is the way you can tell other types of stories, right? So there's a lot of techniques in there which you can actually tie to a different data set. So for example, I'm going to shamelessly plug it, uh, sorry for that. Two years ago, I tried to tag, for example, the techniques uh, associated with how, many, how much effort it is for a threat actor to perform that. And I worked with my colleagues at the time on that to actually evaluate that. And that created a pretty cool data set for me to work with. And I mean, this is just one example. I mean, there are plenty of other examples, and, and that, is, that allows us to figure out new ways to prioritize. And now usage. So again, adoption. Yeah, people have adopted it. We have it in our network, et cetera. We, we, we're using it. No, you have adopted it, and now you start using it. And then you get into these interesting discussions. And so, for example, if I see... What I'm seeing on screen now is, is two, two questions I get asked often, and they actually more or less are the same questions. Um, and they basically show the difference between teams new with attack and teams that are actually seasoned in using attack. So this for me is like a little gradient to see, okay, so this is where they are, okay, okay, okay. Um, but one thing I want to highlight here is that both are fine, both are important, and I'd like to just emphasize that. But the thing I'm trying to highlight here is that using attack is something that might appear easy, but it's pretty hard to actually re re start using it. Uh, you get into nuances instantly. You focus on a certain technique. Okay, that technique has 20 procedures to actually execute that. Do you want to focus on that? And then, and then some people are like, oh, you, you completely lost me. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm seeing often. I think this is something I, I really need to, 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 to set the stage on. And this is also important for my work when I'm doing this so-called scenario-based defense, where I actually create those scenarios and then starting to use that attack method in, in this uh, concept. And um, with that, 
let's, instead of just diving in immediately into the details, I'd like to start with uh, another thing as well. Um, and, and that is that attack is not sexy. I'm going to highlight it instantly. I, I do think that if people, and I've alluded to this before, the first thing people look at is, is that matrix and they're like, holy cow, what is this? Um, and I think uh, we have to do some lovemaking to actually make it work a bit better for everyone, right? Um, and, and I can imagine people who have spent some time in making it you know, readable for people uh, or explain it to somebody else outside of this room, for example, it has been a bit difficult. But I'd like to emphasize that first impressions do matter. And if people, um, uh, I'm not sure about all of you, but if I meet uh, some of executives that basically give me uh, that they just don't care about the attack matrix. They just want to you know, see what is the conclusion coming out of that. And, and, and first impressions on that matter, right? And that's also where you see creative ways, uh, uh, luckily for us, creative ways to actually report this coverage. And I think the previous speakers also showed that that you could use different ways to actually visualize that. And I think the Trellix team also showed some ways with the video. And I like that a lot. And I th I, in every thread landscape I produce, I really try to steer away from the bingo card. And I encourage every one of you to do that as well. Because we, I'm, I'm not saying we have to make attack sexy, but we do have to figure out ways, new creative ways to at least make it uh, stick. That's it, but like that. And another problem uh, or limitation I tend to see is people focusing on they have adopted the tech and then they started using it and then they think, oh crap, this isn't working. This is too complex. You might have seen that. And what then happens is that people try to combine techniques, for example. And that really scares me if that happens. Because if that happens, that means that we have custom techniques, custom everything that, say, that costs me additional time to prep. It costs me additional time to actually make mappings if I'm responsible for that. Um, but I, I, I have a lot of issues with local customizations. Um, obviously, because of the standardization bit, right? <laughs> I think the uh, I think um, when I was talking to Blake late, late last last night, I think one of the ideas on, on initially getting to attack was the whole standardization part. So why do that? So always be on the lookout for if people try to customize this because it's a, for me it's a clear red flag. And and maintaining that central data model or metaverse, if you will, I think that is that is key. For all of us to stay using that and also the relationship to different ma uh, matrices but also the relationships to different other frameworks it could be the kill chain it could also be something that something new that comes up a a in two years i don't know but what i do think is that we need to standardize uh, more to keep it relevant and you might think this is this isn't uh, is this really a discussion uh, we, you wouldn't believe the many times i had this discussion And another one, one of those discussions, is the TTP discussion. So um, obviously, when uh, we in the cybersecurity community love to borrow stuff from uh, uh, the military and police, etc., and uh, and obviously we also do a pretty poor job in adopting these phrases. And I think people from that background can relate to that. Um, and one of those things also the TTP discussion. And I personally think, for me, it's really important because it provides me the granularity to go from a procedure level notation and then move upwards into what does that mean. But it's also a, a, yeah, it's also a problem. People tend to stay high level, right? Because if they don't understand the technical jargon, then they just start to simplify stuff. And even though we, we uh, with the, the introduction of, of, uh, of sub-techniques and the introduction, or the, no, we, not the introduction, but the use of procedures, you know, we, we've been at this detailing bit for quite a while, but I'd like to at least give some attention to the fact that we, have not, we don't have any issues making it more complex, we have issues making it more simpler, right? And that, and that leads to, you know, some of the thought uh, biases, you know, is this complete, is this fresh, uh, do we have any um, problems with that? What do we think on that? And, and obviously, I'd like to also reference the, the uh, finally on the process, uh, the procedure side. I think that's the most important because that's where the nuance happens. If you have like you know 14 ways to do PowerShell, you know what is wh when do you have certain completion on that? When when does that happen? 
So new, what I'm, what I'm trying to say with this is nuance matters. And with everyone you're speaking with, nuance you put in that, in that uh, conversation, it's so crucial, especially in this T2P discussion. <clears throat> and now I'm going to gonna sh do a bit of how I usually go through the whole scenario-based defense. And the first step I usually bring all these limitations together is, is the hypothesis part. And this is basically just brainstorming with the team I help and then work, work on that to actually figure out, okay, so how do we proceed on that? And, and attack obviously allows me to prioritize greatly because I can simply say, okay, they're, they're in this vertical and et cetera. But there's two main limitations I've found over the years. And, and then one is that context is not usually understood. And what I mean by that is that sometimes we see people working in certain contexts that aren't as, I would say, effective. So for example, they would execute certain scenarios if they don't have any data sources in that environment. And yeah, that's pretty, pretty dumb if you ask me. But then again, you know, that's what's happening all the time. People wanting to test stuff, but it's not really in that you know, data space. And related to that is that you sometimes see more benefit in if you have a certain, for example, if you have a, an R&D environment uh, then you, uh, or, or an insider uh, component, and you sometimes want to focus more on the behavioral aspect of things. So I tend to spend also some thoughts on, on that aspect and figure out that because that gives me more insight into context and some more points of attention where we should address the data sources. And finally, when I'm, uh, one final lesson I have on that is, is when I create these hypotheses, is, is, is this a lab thing or is this a, a thing we actually do in the real world? And I think Selena in the beginning alluded to this, you know, why focus on these APT actors if there's like thousands of ransomware actors coming after you which are more likely to do that. And you can have a discussion on priority on that. I think that is, um, that is one, and the second is also what, is, what, is, what are some of the lab techniques, some of the really sophisticated stuff we're seeing. And that's also, by the way, some of the things I would love to see here, the, 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 the MITRE team talk about some of the abstract techniques they get reported, but uh, that's a different story. Um, if you have an hypothesis, then you build scenarios, and, and how I actually always try to emphasize it is make a, make a decision first if you want to use attack as your metaverse. And what I mean by that is that it will dictate how you report everything afterwards, right? Um, this could be simply um, talking about results of a report or anything, or a pen test, or a red team operation, or whatever, or just simply a purple team. But making sure that there's common ground uh, that you focus on the tech, I think that is key, and that's, that discussion is sometimes not held explicitly. Obviously, when you get that done, you can think about, do we involve certain groups or on that angle. And, and I'd like to call that the adversary playbook in which you say, this is a certain group that has certain techniques and we combine that into a playbook. And I find that really useful because that also allows me to have a discussion on what kind of sequencing we should use. And what I mean by sequencing is the order of events. And obviously the, um, I think the Trellings team for, for it also mentioned this, that the sequencing is super important because some of these sequences of, of activities you know, they can happen in, in 10 seconds. And that is, uh, yeah, I, th I think that is a, also a really underestimated aspect. If you put it in a list, if you put it in a tag, in, in, in a, just a drop down, uh, whatever, and you don't get that nuance. Uh, and I think also um, uh, one of the other speakers alluded to that. If you see certain activities happening in context, that also gives you some opportunities to actually monitor on that as well. So I, I think that that element is important. And that leads me to the, to the other point, is the, is the time stamping thing. And, I, and I'm really adamant on that. I also think we always have to emphasize that. And this is not happening enough, in my opinion, the time stamping bit. Because that also dictates what, what kind of time constraints do we have. Do we have people uh, focusing on 30 minute, uh, 30 minute reconnaissance or 30 second reconnaissance? And that are nuances which I uh, really think are really, really interesting to see that happening. And that also leads you to, to think about, okay, so what is the freshness of a certain um, scenario? And then you actually validate them and you can either validate them manually or automatically. And manually is obviously the whole red team uh, penetration testing uh, expertise. Um, and, and, and there you can have a discussion on what is the value of each of these. And one thing I tend to find limiting in some cases is the discussion when we do manual testing is if we should test a certain technique or not, it's the simulation or emulation discussion. 
And I'm not going to start a brawl to actually en encourage this, but this is a real problem sometimes. And I do see that some of the people um, emphasize that you've paid for a red team, so we're going to find ways around it. Yeah, but did we have explicit conversations with the client to actually figure out, or did, did you just want to test that specific technique if that works? And that is a, I think that is a, a problematic, a limiting factor if some. On the automatic side, I can talk about all the practice, the practical uses of that, but I do want to emphasize what, what I don't think is working well. You know, this relies on the whole procedural uh, operation. And this, you know, then you have to know all the procedures. And, and that sometimes when you have automated everything you know, then, <laughs> then what's next? And that creativity bit, that is sometimes limiting for some of the teams I work with. And finally, the reporting bit. The reporting bit is also how you tie back in all the things if you use attack as your metaverse. And <clears throat> so I, I might have alluded to a, th a few things I, I, I don't think are working uh, as well as I hope, um, but I do want to emphasize the following, and that is I personally think that attack is one of the greatest cybersecurity achievements of the last decade. And I can say that with a straight face because every day I'm using it, I can actually relate to everything I knew, and I, there I have a team behind it which actually listens and works on, you know, providing feedback, etc. And I really enjoy that. And I think that is so awesome, and I think that is also a testament why they keep the things are we see today. We have this big crowd online in physical. I think that is I think that is awesome, and uh, I, I and I, what one thing I do like to see more is people who are emphasizing um, the things that don't work well. Um, maybe like this conversation, but maybe even more blunt, if you will. And if you would ask me afterwards, you know, what are the, the couple things that I think we should be focusing on, or at least some points of attention, I, I think if I would uh, put it on the people process technology angle, I think, first of all, we need to expand the, the knowledge of the adopting community. And especially the people just starting with attack, there are more people just starting with attack than we all think. You know, everyone in this room might be biased and think, you know, everybody uses this. Well, it's not the case. You know, on a daily basis, I still have conversations with people who never heard of it and who've been in the industry for more than a decade, right? Um, and that is fine, but that is also something we need to focus on. And I think also that the sharing feedback aspect is completely undervaluated. And what I mean by that is that. Um, it's very easy to send a tweet to, to uh, think about, you know, why is this a SharePoint technique? Why isn't this an attack? And then send tweets. And I'm like, yeah, but actually, that was the reason why, I, why I've held this talk, just because somebody did that. Um, <laughs> but, but the reason why I'm saying is, is that it's super easy with these, this team to actually just, you know, there's an email address, there's a community, there's Twitter, there's everything, you know? Why not use that? Um, so I encourage every one of you online, and in this room to actually do that and just help, you know, and maybe they should do something cool. Like I contributed to an attack and I have a t-shirt. I don't know. But the point I'm trying to make is sharing feedback. Um, and uh, finally, we should also challenge the vendor ecosystem because I also think that sometimes the vendor ecosystem isn't emphasizing that, uh, that, that procedural discussion enough. So everyone challenge your vendors accordingly. Um, I already mentioned to that, feedback is key. Uh, uh, don't complain, just you know, send the feedback. Um, the community decides where this framework is going. Uh, uh, I think they won't explicitly say it, I hope they will, but I think it's underestimated. People think, hey, that's MITRE. Yeah, it's funny, people also refer to ATT&CK as MITRE. M MITRE is just a huge com com company and ATT&CK is just one component. Um, but, but that is my key message here. And, and if, you, if you go back to the office on Thursday and think, you know, what is the true level adoption you have? Uh, that is my challenge to all of you. Um, and, and also, you know, how are we telling the right nuanced story from procedure to base to boardroom? And with that, I will uh, leave you to it. Wow. And great parting words. I'll leave you to it. I love it. Um, thank you, my friend. That was amazing. And honestly, I will explicitly say it. This attack is our framework, exactly as you highlighted. It's not something, you know, I, if we could tell you the best way to do cyber, we would. would. Attack grows and is built by the community. So exactly as you said, 
not just that, the, the feedback, you know, the adoption, that was really powerful. So thank you so much. Good stuff. I don't think we have time for questions, but uh, sounds good. Again. Cheers, everyone.